Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration, wonder, and storytelling to change our world for the better. And we believe that everyone of every identity and experience should be able to safely explore the wonder of our world. These Explorer Classroom events are designed to connect students from all across the globe with our National Geographic Explorers. And our Explorers are pretty cool people to connect with. They're storytellers, scientists, adventurers, filmmakers, photographers, researchers, and, and so much more. And once we're all here together in the Explorer Classroom, we have a short lesson and an extended Q&A. All summer break, we'll be running Explorer Classroom events on Wednesday and Thursday plus some more cool opportunities you can find at natgeoed.org slash explorer classroom. And today we are very, very lucky to be joined by Saif Kuzme. Saif is a self-taught Moroccan photographer who specializes in social issues. I can't wait for you guys to see his shots. They are so beautiful and so powerful. He's joining today to teach us about his photography, his country, and how storytelling and photography can be a way to change our world. But before we get to that, I do want to acknowledge that we are joined on screen by several students today. And we have many more of you out there watching along on YouTube. Hi, folks. So far, I think I see that we have folks watching from Canada, the United Kingdom, India, Egypt, Texas, Illinois, California, Washington, and probably many, many more places too. So if I've missed you, please say hello and introduce yourself in the chat bar. We'd love to say hi and give your location some shout outs. Um, but for now, I think that that is plenty from me. Uh, it's time for us to turn it over to Saif for today's Explorer Classroom lesson. Hi, thank you for having me today. Hi, everyone. So uh, my name is Saif Kuzmat, a documentary photographer based in Morocco. I'm very happy to be with you and to share my uh, stories and how I work as a storyteller uh, with the photography. So let's, let's we're gonna start with a short video that uh, introduce my work and how I uh, become a photographer. And after that, we I, I'm gonna show you uh, one of the, the project I did with National Geographic Society about uh, migration in North Africa. So let's start with this, this small video and then see you in a bit. This is me, Safe, a documentary photographer, and this is my story. I grew up in the 90s in Sawira, a tiny city in southern Morocco. My dad had a hardware store where I used to work with him in the summer, and my mom took care of us and was very strict about our education. Like many kids who grew up in the 90s, had internet and phones, so we used to play soccer in the street and other games around the neighborhood. In my childhood, we didn't have access to culture like museums or libraries. So I spent this part of my life dreaming, observing people, and learning how to connect with them. In 2006, after finishing high school, I moved to France, where I lived for more than 10 years. In France, I explored Europe, art, and museums. While I studied computer science, then civil engineering, and worked as project manager. But during all this time, I was tired of the system I was in and totally lost. So one day I left my job, bought a camera and started traveling around the globe. And what was supposed to be a six month trip became two years. After two years traveling, I came up with the conclusion that I wanted to connect with more human beings, tell their impactful stories, and inspire the change around me. That's how I became a photographer. But the hardest thing was to make money from my photography, so I printed some of my pictures, framed them, and sold them in the street. But it wasn't enough to pay the bills. So I watched this video. My dream for 
vision do you want to turn into reality? Truth immediately will tell you. See it? Believe it. Act on it. Come up with a plan and started executing it. I borrowed some money for this camera. I did the first story and it wasn't good. Then I produced the second one and it wasn't enough. In the following years, I started immersing myself with my subject and I found my way of telling stories. I worked on a story about young Sub-Saharan Africans who are trying to reach Europe and spent more than three years following their journey from Mali to Spain. Then I did a story about enclaved villages in the high Atlas Mountains in Morocco and tried to understand their story and how they manage the impact of climate change on their daily lives. Then I worked on another story about lost nomads in the Zag region and understood how the last decades of history and globalization have changed their way of living. I also went to Mauritania and started a new story about men and women from the Haratins caste who are still suffering from traditional slavery and its consequences. But still, I didn't understand how it was possible in 2020 without any opposition from the international scene. And last year, I went to Rwanda and made a story about Rwandan youth to understand how they manage their trauma, the coexistence and the building of a future after the 94 genocide against the Tutsi. In the middle of all this, I sent a lot of emails, showed my work to a lot of people, but didn't always get answered. I was torn between my desire to continue telling these stories and the challenges they were putting me back. Then I remembered this. For me, photography is not an end in itself, just the right medium to reach my desire to connect with people and bring a change. And ultimately, it's helping me as a person grow and understand a little bit more the world they live in. So I, I hope uh, this video helped you a little bit more to understand uh, my journey and how I start uh, photography. So now let's let's go dive into a, a project uh, I call Away from the Dreamland about migration in uh, North Africa. Uh, before we share before I share some pictures, I would love to give you, yeah, let's go this map. Okay, uh, there we go. So this project starts uh, in 2014, why before I start working on the field and taking pictures? I, I, I remember I was traveling in Northern Morocco and uh, I was traveling in a car with, with, with some friends and uh, in, uh, in the middle of nowhere, we, we find a group of three migrants who were working next to the forest. And this image stayed with me, and uh, I really want to understand why they, they are there, why, where they came from. And I, I, at that time, I, I had many questions in my mind, but those questions stayed with me for a while before going back uh, there in 2016 and start working in this project. So to give you a, a really uh, some context and in the environment of, of this project, here is the map of uh, North West Africa. Uh, like, and in the red line, this is the route of migration. So every year, uh, a lot of young men and women from West Africa, they, they find their way to North Africa to reach the border uh, between Europe and, and the African continent. And Morocco, we can see it here in North, he had the, the closest uh, 
distance uh, with Europe. And uh, the distance between the two shores is only 12 kilometers. And we have also in, in, in the African continent, in Northern Morocco, two Spanish enclaves. So basically it's Europe inside the African continent. And every year people, they come across uh, all the, the, the African continent, they go through the desert and they find themselves in Morocco and they're trying to, to, to climb a fences around those two enclaves to, to go inside the, the, the European, uh, uh, inside Spain, sorry. So uh, basically in 2016, I, I was really uh, interested to, uh, to tell the stories of, of the, the, those numbers that behind migration and uh, understand where they came from, why, and all the questions that they had in, in, in mind. So basically I, I introduced myself. I went back to this forest next to the border. They call it the Mount Gurugu, where there is uh, thousands of uh, migrants living there, hidden from uh, for, from the police, waiting uh, like every day they went until it's dark and they, they walk through the, the, the bush, they find their way to the border and they try to climb. But it's really, really, really hard right now to, to climb those borders because basically there is a lot of military uh, like protecting this area and a lot of guards taking care of this place. So here is some pictures. I'm going to show you. Like here is a group of uh, migrants going through the forest, trying to find their way to the to, to the border. And I I, I remember I, I met this uh, young man. He was 18 years old. The name's Keita. He'd been in the road since he was 14 years old. And he, he had no choice. He was struggling, living really hard life there in the bush, in, in, in really, uh, uh, like, there is, there's nothing around. Like, uh, they're, they're, just, they're struggling a lot. And he told me it's hard. He, he can't go back home. Uh, for him, he had no choice. He had to keep going uh, because uh, he was living like in a really poor area. He didn't find a job. He, his family can not provide uh, like resources, and he didn't want. He never went to school. So, and it it, it was uh, interesting to see how this young boy, uh, who was like still a teenager, trying to find uh, a solution to his problem. And he, he was seeing uh, uh, this journey to Europe as a solution for his struggles. He, he didn't want to give up, even if he was uh, uh, really struggling in the forest. He, he wanted to keep going and try again and again and again. And he told me he, he tried climbing the border moon that, that 200 times. And the, he get catch and they, they put like they, they send him far away from the border. He find, a, he find a way to come back to the forest and try again and again. And right now he's still living in, in the forest, still, still trying to, to climb this border. And uh, here, here in, the, in, in the picture, we can see some migrants trying to make hooks because they, 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 they create this, this technique to climb very fast and catch like the fence of, of the border. So, like here we can see migrant with the, with the hooks. Um, here in the picture, a group of migrants waiting in the forest be, before uh, the attempt to the border. So my way of working, it was more in an immersive way. So I spent time with them. I try to, to understand how they feel, how they live the situation. I also explain why I'm doing this work. It is important to document their situation, to tell their stories uh, and to give names uh, to those uh, just numbers of migrants. Uh, we want to understand what's their specific stories. And then they, they, they really understood the importance of, of the job and they gave me the access, which, which is what like really important here, having the access to, to this story. Like here is the picture, a picture I found like with the, I, I guess a family of some of, of those guys. It was just in the ground uh, and uh, it, it, it gave us like the background of, of those people. They are not just there, uh, they have families as well. And uh, they are like, the, their families believe in them, and, and they are also part of this pressure that they have to go uh, forward. They have to keep moving forward. They, they have to, to claim this border and reach their dreams. So 
Uh, here is uh, uh, a picture of uh, Muhammad from uh, from Mali, and here is in in the in this uh, camp in, uh, near the forest. And in the background, we can see Melilla. Melilla is one of the in Spanish enclaves. So basically, in the background, it's Europe, in in the African continent, and they can see it every morning, but they can't reach it because of of the fences and the borders around. So, and Muhammad, he told me he didn't call his mom for almost six months because he was ashamed to tell her that he was still stuck in Morocco. Uh, and he was really depressed about his situation because he's so close, but he can't get there. And uh, for him, it's, it's a lot of like, you know, it's like emotional struggle for him, like waking up every day, seeing he, he's so close to his dream, but he can't go there. It's, it, it, it was destroying for him. So, and a few months later, like I worked on this project for almost three years. And at some point I came up with the idea to, to make a series of the, of the backpacks uh, uh, of, of those migrants, what they have, what they carry on to this, to this uh, border. And what's funny, sometimes you find like a French book, people there, they are like learning, they're preparing their journey. They, they want, they dream about France, for example, Paris. And he starts, this, this young man starts learning French in the road, like inside this chaos of, of the camp and the, and the forest. He, he finds a, a French book and he starts learning about French. So a few years later, I, I, uh, I, I, I wanted to, to understand roots of this migration, why uh, they leave their home country. So I come up with the idea to uh, find some uh, uh, young men, uh, young migrants uh, uh, in different stage of their journey to Europe. And I asked them to, to draw me a map uh, where they came from, the road, how, how they're going to go to where they want to go and, and how. So basically I want to, to start from the beginning. I went to Mali and they found uh, some uh, uh, young migrants preparing their trip. They want to go. Like, for example, here in the picture, his, his drawer, he was working in, in, in a mine in, in Mali, making some money, preparing his... Uh, uh, his journey to Europe, and I asked him, "Can you draw me a map, a map of your of your of your journey?" So his map was very easy and simple. Here was like his village in Mali. From there, he 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 wrote Algeria, and then Morocco, and then Morocco, uh, Europe. He he said he wanted to go to Germany. It was for a very simple map, easy. And then I, I want to to. Uh, and I want to say that I asked him, can you draw me a map? He was also living in Mali, uh, working in, in a farm, preparing his, his journey to Europe. He told me, I want to join my two friends, my two brothers, sorry. My two brothers, they are living in Paris. They, 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 they went through uh, North Africa, Morocco, and they found their way to Paris. And his map was also so simple, easy, like from Mali, I want to go to Bamako, the capital, from there Morocco, and from Morocco to Spain, and from Spain to Paris. And then I went to Morocco and I asked my friend Keita, can you draw me your, 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 your journey in, in, in a map? Uh, and his, his map was way more complex than the, than the other one because he was really struggling and we can understand that the road it was harder than we can we, we can see from the the perspective of those young men who are still in the country uh, they, they, they didn't expect that the road is more harder than than than, than it was in real and same with with the same with Umaru, he was also struggling in Morocco for more than five years trying to reach the border. He, he tried like several times, but he didn't get there. And his map was also very complex. And uh, I, I want also to, to my friend Madhu, uh, who was uh, imported from Morocco after spending four years trying to climb the border, but he, he didn't get there. At some, at some point he was stopped at the border and deported from Morocco to Mali. And he was really struggling with the situation because he came from um, uh, from an area with a lot of uh, gold mining and uh, there is like this uh, foreigner companies they, they, they're uh, extracting uh, gold from his region and they they just send this uh, uh, aboard so and he felt uh, he, he told me that it was very hard for him to see people from his village very poor uh, and uh, knowing that there's a lot of gold around around his area and they, they can't uh, take advantage from it and he, he was really disappointed because 
uh, he was he was so close to reach his dream and and, and find a better life in Europe. And he's back to this his his village with where, where there's a lot of struggle with this mining story. So and and then I went to Spain and uh, I found my friend Draw. We met a few years before he he get to Spain in Morocco, and he he drew me his map as well. And we can see it. It's it's also very complex map with different stages of, of his journey. And in uh, draw the, the, the specific thing uh, uh, with, with his story, like he, he was in Spain for almost now, he's, he's been there for almost two years, but he was also struggling uh, because he, the policy in Europe has changed for refugees and migrants. And he was working on the farm illegally, picking up strawberries uh, or olives, depending on the seasons. And he was also disappointed by the, by, by, by the European life he was living there. And he, he said the image he, he had imagined before leaving his country was way better than the reality of, of, of the dream in itself. So ba basically here, what, what I want you to, to remember, so there's three situations, like uh, people, they leave their countries uh, for different reasons, and they are trying to uh, reach a better life. And Europe represents, uh, for most of them, the unique solution they, they have found. And in and, and, and the the second situation, it's in Morocco. Uh, basically, Morocco represents uh, just a borderland between before reaching the dream. And at, at the end, it becomes a waiting room for a lot of those guys it, with a lot of struggles. And on one hand, they, they have uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, the fact that they're so close to their dream, but they can't reach it because of the fence and, and you know, all these policies around the borders. And on the other hand, they are ashamed to go back to their, to their, their country because uh, like the families put too much pressure on them and they are scared, scared to face their failure to say, okay, we are here, but we didn't reach the dream we were preparing for years now. And, and, and the, third, the third situation is for those who, May, made it safely to Europe. And because of the policy, uh, the European policy right now, they, they, they can't have like a real situation and build a, build a better life. And they found themselves struggling. So Europe at the end, and like basically Europe right now, maybe it's not the solution for, for, for this problem. And they are just disappointed and, and they feel themselves, as I said before, far, far away from the Europe they have dreamed before. So basically that, that's it for today. I hope that uh, uh, it was uh, short and sweet for you guys. And uh, I'm here if you have any, any questions. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Saif. That was um, amazing. These are really complicated stories, but your portraits make it so easy to focus on, on the no. people in them. So thank you. And for folks learning along at home, we'd love to see what you do with this. Maybe you do a follow-up activity from our family guide. If you draw a picture or write a story, or maybe you start doing your own documentary photography, whatever it may be, please send it to us. Um, we, would, we would love to see it. You can send it to us on Twitter by tagging at NatGeoEducation and using hashtag Explore Classroom. And that way we can make sure Saif gets a chance to see all of your amazing work. And now, as he said, it is question time. Question time is our favorite part of the day. If you're watching along on YouTube, keep sending those questions in the chat bar. They are great. We would love to see more of them. We record everything you send in. So please only send your question one time. If you spam us, we have to put you in timeout and that's, that's no fun. Um, and if you're up on screen with me, get your nice loud voice ready. I will call on you in just a moment. Um, our first question for the day comes to us from Connie. Connie's wondering if telling these stories has helped these migrants. Like, help those migrants, I, I, I can't say it. it's a big word for me, but it will help the next generation of migrants maybe. Like the ones who they think going, reaching Europe is so easy. Like showing them this work, they will help them to take a better decision maybe. But for those that who are already in the road, I think my story, it's, it's, it's too late for them. Like they can't learn nothing from it, from it. but like for the ones who are still in, the, in, the, in, their, in their country, preparing their, their journey to, to reach Europe, 
maybe it's helpful. Awesome. And we had another really popular question in the chat bar. Folks were wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the hooks. What were the what were the hooks for? So basically, uh, climbing the border just uh, hand free, it's really hard, and it's like it needs more effort. So uh, the, those migrants, they are super smart, and in 2014, they came up with the idea to make hooks to climb like very fast and have a, like a better catch uh, on the fence. So they they just uh, create these small hooks. And, uh, and, and yeah, so that helped them go faster on the, on, on, on the like basically the fence, it's a, a triple fence, six meter tall. So it's, it's not like it's just simple fence. It, you, you have to be like really strong to make, to make it through the fence. So, and, and hooks help, help them to go like very quick. Brilliant. Well, thank you for explaining that a little more for us. And let's visit an on-screen group for our next question. Let's go to Indiana and Chile. Go for it, folks. What's your first question? Um, you know how you said you uh, photographed um, slaves in 2020? Um, what's the condition there, like, like there, wherever you photograph? So th th this is another, thank you for question, your question first. So this is a, a, a story I made in Mauritania. In Mauritania, it's, it's located between Morocco. It's in West Africa, between Morocco and Senegal. And it's a huge land with a lot of desert around. And uh, they have been practicing slavery since like a really long time. But uh, because like there is no road, there's no that much civilization like in, in, in the countryside, some areas, they've been still practicing this kind of like really traditional slavery. They've been keeping people, working for them for free without any compensations, and uh, even if it's illegal. And it's one of the last places in the world where, where slavery still exists. So I, I made a story about it. And if you are curious, you can go, I can maybe leave a link to my website uh, to Celeste. And, you can go check on, on, on the story. You can see some pictures, read, read uh, some captions, and you, can, you will understand. And if you have some more questions, I would be more happy. I would be very happy to, to answer by email or something. Awesome. And we've got Ada, who is wondering how long you spend on each individual story. So basically, I, as I said, I started this story in 2000, by the end of 2016, and uh, I went there in 2017, like very, uh, every like three weeks, I, I was spending there two to three weeks. And it was just uh, keeping in touch with those people, following up. And in 2018, I, I spent like a few months go, going there. And in 2019, I, I, I really, went back following up with the people I met in 2016, 17, and 2018. And they, I, I followed them to their, where they were living. And they spent almost like 10 days to two weeks with each one of, of, of those individuals. But basically the whole story took me three years, a little bit more than three years. Thank you for the dedication. The stories are so powerful. During those 10 days to two weeks, how are you building trust to, to get these amazing stories? Like, as, as I said before, the first thing was to tell them why, why I'm, I'm there, why I want to tell this story, explain you know, my story as, as an individual, like, I'm not here just to take your picture, but like, we're going to know each other, where I came from, uh, what's my background, and listening to them and trying to understand what there's, what, like, their struggles, and uh, it needs time, like, at the beginning, they were a little bit scared, they didn't want to open to me, like, really quickly. And by spending like time with them, I, I, I lived as well, I lived with them in the forest. So I've been living with them, sleeping with them, eating with them for, for a few days, each time I, I am there. So at same point, they like, they see you as one of them. And in, in, this, this immersive work helps to build the trust for me. Amazing. Well, let's take our next question from Charlotte, who's up on screen with us. Go for it, Charlotte. Um, I was wondering if you had any uh, tips on how you could tell a story or a narrative through photography effectively. So uh, for like 
if if I okay, I can see this. Uh, to give you like really good tips, like try to connect with the people you want to to, to photograph, like building a, a deep and trust with with the, the person, like the group of people that you want to photograph. It's it's really uh, important in this approach uh, in documentary photography. If if you are not connected to someone. The, he, he can't open to you and this person will not tell you like his real story he, he, and the, you have you have to be like find the, 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 the right distance to take the photographs listening and uh, and build the trust at the same time and it comes with practice like you, uh, sometimes it's easy uh, to uh, did a, to, to, to do a story about your family, for example, you don't have to build the trust, the trust is already there. Then you have only to focus in, in the pictures and in the story. And once you, you manage to, to, like, you know how to, to tell a story, how to work with your camera, how to, to, to connect with people, then it becomes more easier to do it with someone you don't know. You know, maybe you can, you can start by baby steps. Awesome. We saw photos of other people's backpacks, but Saif, while you were in the forest immersed in the story, uh, what was in your bag? What, what did you carry with you? I, I, I carried on like one backpack with my camera. Uh, I, I was having the same clothes basically <laughs> for, for uh, because I, 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 I was living with migrants. Like I don't have to be fancy or stuff like that. They have to be like really simple. Uh, then they can see you as the same level as them. Like I don't have to, to wear fancy clothes. I have just my cameras and uh, yeah, a notebook and some simple stuff, not that much, but one backpack as well, so. Awesome. And let's grab another question from Anian and Tilly. Go for it. How many people do you meet who are doing the journey? Sorry, say it again. How many people did you meet who are doing um, that journey? So basically, uh, there are a lot. They came from different countries, basically from West Africa, as I, as I said before. So in, in, it's, it's a huge group and there, there is different group as well in different places. But for, for my story, I, I was focusing in the Malian community. Uh, and it was, for me, it was much easier to, to focus in one community, to build a trust with one co group of people. And my community were, were around a thousand, thousand maybe in, in this area. But in the forest, it's, it depends of, 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 of the months, depends of the season, but I would say a thousand. Because sometimes when it's really cold, people, they, they don't stay that much in the forest. They try to find like a warmer, warmer place. But then in the summertime, they are much, much more, more than a thousand. And we've got a lot of folks commenting on how sad and serious a lot of your work is. Um, what keeps you motivated in going through the difficult subject matter? So in my work, uh, I believe that telling this kind of story can bring a change. And this is something that's really important for me, like contribute to the society and the environment that I'm living in. And uh, by telling the story, uh, I bring the light and start, I start the debates uh, to uh, change things. And it's my contribution to the world I'm, I'm, uh, I want to see. So uh, before starting photography, I was uh, really aware of this injustice in our societies, but I, I, I didn't find my place uh, to contribute to that. And when I start doing photography, I, I just bring uh, these two fields together and I found myself doing uh, social issues uh, as a storyteller and, and photographer. And in, in my case, it, it's, it's the better way for me to contribute and enjoy my work at the same time. Amazing. And speaking of contributing, we've got username Alkesna and Connie again, who are wondering um, how people who aren't photographers can help out. Um, is there somewhere to get resources? Is there something that, that regular people can be doing? It's, uh, 
I, I think it depend of, of uh, like if you're talking this specific issue, like in general, like for, for example, uh, 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 let's talk in general, like if you are interested in an issue and you want to help there, maybe you, you can find an NGO and they, are need, they need uh, help on specific issue, or like in specific uh, fields, uh, maybe by uh, talking around you uh, about this issue, maybe by doing a presentation in your school. And uh, there is different ways and you, you, you can fix the limits. How, how much, like, uh, are you, uh, can you can you help with your time with with your knowledge with your money like it depends on you and your and on your situation awesome well let's go back to charlotte for another question go for it um i was wondering what uh, equipment you use because i'm guessing it would have to be quite lightweight to carry around hmm. no uh, i'm using natural lights and i use like just uh, uh one like yeah I'd say two cameras with uh, fixed lens and i'm really I'm using like really simple material not that much um i'm just trying to focus on the story and the the people and like with this kind of story for me we don't have to think that much about the material it's just a tool just a tool to reach the story and uh, find a connection with people like for me i don't care that much about material I'm, I'm using the simple thing i have to 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 tell the story that's awesome and we've got a classroom wondering when you first started taking photographs did you always know you wanted to do this no i was before starting photography i i, I was project manager in in construction in uh, and they worked for 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 a few years and after that i was uh, totally lost and i didn't find myself in the corporate world and i want to to build something like uh, uh, but it, i didn't know that back then what, what it was so i started traveling for a few years exploring the world like meeting people connecting and at some point uh, uh, it was in 2014 yeah in 2014 and they found myself with a camera and they start telling stories and the camera when I was traveling helps me to uh, connect with other people and from that I enjoy it and they said like telling stories and another story and another story and, uh, and until I found myself building a career as a photographer. Well our next question is what's next on your list? Is there a project that you really really would love to do? Yeah, basically right now I'm preparing a new project about climate change and uh, the effects of climate change in Moroccan oasis. Like, uh, I don't know if you know, there's a lot of oasis in Morocco and uh, uh, they, are, they are like uh, in, in really big transition right now with the desertification and climate change. I'm trying to document this transition. Tra transition sorry and uh, telling the story of the communities uh, out there awesome and our next question comes to us from the youtube chat bar folks are wondering if there's any one individual who really stands out uh, uh, the story of kaita again i can maybe share his picture again oh where's the where are you guys yeah, Kaita, Kaita was amazing. Like he, as I told you before, he left his Mali when he was 14 and he was struggling uh, all along the road and he lost some, some of his friends, they, they, they died on the road. And he was, jailed. he tried before coming to Morocco, he tried his chance in, in Libya and he was jailed in Libya for three months. Then he, he came to Morocco and uh, he had an injury in his leg for a few months and he, he was really struggling a lot, but he's still trying hard to, to reach his uh, European dream and, and he's like, he's a teenager basically and it was heartbreaking to see like a young man with a lot of dreams can't reach what, what he wants in life because of the policies around the world. So, yeah. Awesome, and we've got some questions that are fairly technical about photography. Um, maybe just using that same photo as an example, could you tell us about what goes into to making that picture? 
Okay, let's go back to the picture. Like basically here, it's a diptych of two pictures. The first one is a portrait of, of Keita. Uh, do, do you want like some technical how uh, how I? Okay, I, I use a, a 35 millimeter lens to, I'm, I'm basically uh, working with the 35 millimeter lens uh, 1.4 and uh, yeah, I use it for portraits, but also for landscapes. But I, I really like this kind of uh, uh, portrait with context. So putting some of the environment of, of the subjects that will give us like more information about his life about like, for example, here in, in the portrait of Kaita, we, we can understand that he's living in a bush. We can see the details around. Um, like uh, here, I, I, I use this fabric uh, from Africa, from Mali fabric, and I, 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 I took it as background. So yeah, I, I love this, this lens, the 35. So uh, basically I'm, I'm taking, let's say 80% of my picture with this lens. And at some point it becomes like the lens because every lens have like a specific angle. The lens becomes your eyes. You see the world through this angle. And once you get used to it, you don't have to think that much. You can just tack, tack. It works very easy and, and simple. So that's why you will find every photographer have a favorite lens and they just work hard on, with the same lens. Then they get used to it and become like really simple to, to use. That's amazing. I clearly need to work harder. I do not have that kind of a relationship with a lens yet. So it's, it's inspiring to hear that that will, will come with more practice. Well, Saif, uh, do you have any general advice for the young explorers out there watching today? Uh, general advice, maybe. Uh, okay, let's ha I have two advices. The, the first one, it's uh, explore as much field as you can until you find the field that you really like, you really enjoy, and then work super hard to uh, become an expert in that field. And the, 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 the second uh, advice, uh, don't give up in, in whatever you want. Just work hard and con consistency, it's the key to get whatever you want in life. That's the the two uh, advice that uh, I hope can help a lot of, of you guys to reach your dreams and become worldwide explorers, I hope. Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today. Your photos are so beautiful and so powerful and the stories behind them are just amazing. So thank you for taking the time to join us. And for folks who are at home, you can check out more Explorer Classroom as well as many, many more free educational resources at natgeoed.org. Please share your work with us on Twitter. We'd love to see it. Um, and we hope to see you at some upcoming events. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Um, and that's it for today. I'm going to turn on everyone's microphones nice and loud. Let's say goodbye and thank you to Saif Kusmet. Ready? Bye. 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 Bye.